Hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you happen to be. We are the Media Education Lab. Today is the 4th of November, 2024. My name is Wes Fryer in Charlotte, North Carolina, joined by... I'm Scott Moss, joining you from Los Angeles, California. And we are your co-host today, talking about Renee DeResta's book, Invisible Rulers, The People Who Turn Lies Into Reality. And if you're joining us, please jump into the chat. Let us know where you're coming from. And I will drop in the link here to our presentation slides that we're going to be showing. And we'll get going. So today, we want to know who's in the room. And if you want to, it's kind of a loaded question. Uh, answer the question, how do you feel like the internet has changed our information landscape? You could probably write a dissertation on that. Uh, you can go ahead and chime in there. We're going to go over our format and our collaborative notes. Um, Scott and I are both going to share just a little bit some quotable ideas from Renee and uh, some little quick reflections and current events, because surprise, surprise, this is an extremely timely, timely topic. Um, and we're going to hopefully take about 20 minutes to do that, and then that's going to leave a good 20 minutes for us to go into breakout rooms. And Scott has got some excellent questions that he's going to pose for us, and we're going to let you choose your breakout room this time instead of just getting a random room, and we'll just kind of see how that goes. And if you want to jump around between rooms, you certainly can. So <clears throat> we're using a collaborative Google Doc, and this is a bit exciting to do, but I think it it works. Um, right now, the link has been set for everyone to comment, but I, and I do this with my middle school students too, will let everyone be an editor here for a moment. Now, the uh, I'm going to drop the link into chat. This is optional. You don't have to do this, but if you scroll down, this is in reverse chronological order. So here's today's uh, session. We've got the link to our slides and then our uh, required and optional media. If anybody had a chance to look at that, either, you know, if you have or if you want to do that afterwards, those are, are some good recommendations. But then here below, it says add your session notes and your links. And so if you'd like to put uh, any links that we mention uh, that we talk about during the session, uh, please do. I really think that just a basic Google Doc like that can be real powerful. I do this sometimes with my students. And this media club is a fun opportunity for us to not only learn some new perspectives, perhaps, or learn about some new resources, but be able to practice using some tools. And it's definitely been awesome because I've been connected to the Media Lab since 2019 to have a chance to practice like this. So Renee DeResta, amazing researcher, just a very, very compelling book. One of the most compelling books that I have ever read about the information landscape and the ways in which social media specifically has really changed the ways in which the news cycle works, the ways we get our information, the way that politics works, and really the way that our culture falls. And it just, you know, some some of which is is good and some of which is is bad or negative. I would compare her book for me personally to um, Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky. I don't know if y'all are Clay Shirky fans, but Shirky wrote that book probably in the mid to late 2000s as Web 2.0 was kicking off and things were changing and a very positive book really talking about these very different dynamics. And so what I thought I would do is kind of fun <clears throat> is actually uh, use a couple of my audible bookmarks. So um, if you've read the, let us know in the chat, have you read the book? Did you read it, um, you know, either in print or, or with, you know, Kindle or digital, or did you listen to it? I've listened to this book and I'm going through my second time now. And one of the things that I've done this time listening to the book is I've used these, these audible bookmarks. And so I'm going to flip over to my cloud player and see if I can, uh, see if I can do this. So I, I, I got these on my phone, <clears throat> but you can make bookmarks and you can actually play these and shoot. I don't know. Uh, when I share, let me play this. I don't know that I clicked the right link. Okay, I'm going to do this again because if you've done sharing with screens, you may have had the same thing happen. I need to check share sound, optimize for sound. Okay, so let's see if that works. And please give me a thumbs up if you're sharing your video, if you can hear audio when I click this button. 
This is not a book about social media. There are enough of those. Rather, my focus is on a profound transformation in the dynamics of power and influence, which have fundamentally shifted, and on how we, the citizens, can come to grips with a force that is altering our politics, our society, and our very relationship to reality. So that is a hugely expansive statement, but that's one of the reasons I find this book to be so compelling, and I feel like we could do a year-long study on it, and maybe we should pick it up again and dive into some other specific examples. Um, so that's one bookmark. I'm going to jump now to a bookmark where she talks a little bit about the power we have to wield. And this is one of the takeaways I have from this is I want as a middle school teacher to be talking with my students more about influencers. And I want to be encouraging and empowering other people to use the, the influence that we each have, whether we, you know, have a YouTube channel, or it takes all kinds of forms. Anyway, this is what uh, Duresta says about influencers. ...has been upended. Ordinary people can influence what their friends see, what their communities talk about, and what their country focuses on more easily than ever before. We are no longer the passive recipients of mass media messages. Instead, we all have the power to shape public opinion, to wield the tools that engender virality, to spread messages that reach and potentially influence millions. In so we could do more, but uh, just such compelling analysis of, I think, really fundamental shifts in the ways that the information landscape works and the access that we can have to mainstream, to, to large groups, to, to mass media. So, Scott, I'll hand it off to you and just tell me when you're ready for the next slide. Oh, okay. Thank you, Wes. Um, one of, uh, and these are not all Renee's uh, quote, Renee DeResta's quotes, but the first one is, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and, you know, a lot of people on social media will say, you know, if a certain platform does not uh, allow, you know, uh, you know, suppresses their speech, they say, you know, it's it's uh, a freedom of speech issue. But I love uh, her uh, her expression, her uh, slogan, freedom of speech does not equal freedom of reach. Meaning, yes, you can say what you want, but it doesn't mean that an algorithm has to uh, augment it, perform it, or, uh, you know, uh, spread it more widely, okay? Um, and it's certainly up to the private companies to do that. But I like that because it it's powerful when it rhymes. So, hey, another... Um, a quote that I really liked in the book, which is actually a quote that uh, Duresta quotes um, another uh, author and talks about mass movements uh, on social media, but everywhere, but any mass movement. I think this quote was, uh, it's in 1989, but I believe it uh, actually originates from something earlier. Uh, mass movements can arise and spread without belief in a God, but never without a belief in the devil, meaning you know, if we can, if they can demonize someone, that is something that really can bring groups together and and uh, and and help form a group. And this is happening online quite a lot, as we all know. And I want to quote from another Renee, our friend Renee Hobbs. Uh, when I was reading this book, there's a lot about propaganda, and I thought, hey, I know another good book about propaganda. Uh, Renee Hobbs is uh, Mind Over Media, so I kind of went back and was looking through that. And I love this quote. I think it's right at the beginning of the book that propaganda is responsive to changes in culture, technology, and society. And these things, as I'm about to talk about a little more, all interact with each other and things are changing, but it's really kind of a loop, isn't it? Right. It used to be that we would, let's say, go on to, let's say, Facebook, and I want to join a group about woodworking or bicycling or, but now the the media is influencing us more it's help it's kind of shaping our decisions more than us, us just going to use it uh, that way um some of you may be familiar with this person but it, it's certainly worth looking into um uh in Duresta's book she talks a lot about Edward Bernays who is the you know as the father of uh, public relations i believe he invented the term public relations and the book title um, Invisible Rulers comes from a quote uh, by Bernays. I won't read it to you, but I'll kind of summarize it here, where he says, you know, uh, those people who can uh, manipulate uh, the habits and opinions of the masses 
are the the powerful ones are kind of an invisible government or invisible rulers I and mean, these are the people with the power okay and now this is changing of course it's not just this media elite with control of the technology now everyone can be um you know part of the media basically but he he has a lot of it, interesting uh, thoughts to look at so i won't really go through this but this is just a preview of the topics we're going to have for our breakout rooms we thought it might be good just to kind of pop it up there for a minute uh, before we get to it because um but you know once you get into your room you'll talk about what you talk about but just uh those are gonna we're gonna have uh, five different breakout rooms as we as we um uh, after <laughs> after this bit and, and after we after have a link to the slides uh we drop those in again but this is slide eight if you want to uh preview those and feel free to move the slides as you as we as we go along but we'll continue to share them here as well all right so uh Duresta talks about the trinity she kind of organizes a lot of the book about this the trinity of influencers algorithms and crowds and how they again there was an overlap there how, how they influence each other so i'm going to go into a little detail about each of those and i think the first one is crowds so we know about the, the expression the madness of crowds how people act differently in a group of people, then they would act individually. That whole, if you remember that old experiment about diffusion of responsibility, where we don't act the same. And that's true. And that's probably amplified online where people are more anonymous. It used to be, Katie, it used to be that uh, if you wanted to uh, recruit a group, you know, you're forming a group, you would have to go do that yourself. But now the algorithms can do that. And as we know, the algorithms for most social media platforms are optimized for this outrage and anger and those kinds of things, because that gets people, you know, writing more, gets them online more. We know Facebook uh, certainly does that, and it seems all of them do that. So the algorithms also help form these kinds of crowds. Uh, a quote from the book, um, the crowds require fuel to sustain their outrage or paranoia or mythology to sustain their bespoke reality. I really like that quote because it helps us understand kind of, um, you know, how the crowds can be sustained over time. And uh, another thing that I thought was interesting in this book was that uh, Rene de Resta talks about pseudo events, which we all know um, where those are not, it's not real news. There's things that are created for the news. Uh, I think she uses the example of like a ribbon cutting of a business or these kinds of things where it's like, it says not really news, but someone's going to create it. It's like a photo op, I guess, is, but maybe a multimedia photo op or a social media photo op. And, and one right. thing I'll toss in here is just how important algorithmic literacy is. Uh, it just seems like more and more we are influenced by algorithms. And currently I'm a, a middle school I'm middle school teacher here in Charlotte and North Carolina, <clears throat> and, and I'm teaching coding, but it's just not for the coding class. It really needs to be in all of our classes to some extent, because algorithms are just influencing us so much. And so I think she really does a good job highlighting the way that algorithms have changed what makes the what makes it into the new cycle? Um, what gets you know oxygen, um, and and the idea that the people who are controlling these platforms have and wield such incredible power to direct our attention as well as you know you know focus that attention. It just we're we're living it you know so dramatically right now. I think in the election cycle. Absolutely. If I could just build on that, hopefully not getting us too far um, askew here, is that, yes, we all need computer science. And right now in K-12, computer science seems to be, well, maybe you're in middle school and you have a teacher like Wes who, who do, goes the extra mile and will teach computer science and coding. Or maybe you take it as an elective in high school, but not everyone gets it, right? So, uh, but we do need a little bit of computer science to have that background, that kind of that behind the scenes, just like we would in, and I've said this before in these groups, uh, with media literacy. So in media literacy, we might learn about you know, lighting and music and how does that affect your emotions and these kinds of things. So just as you would do that for other media with algorithms, a little computer science for everybody gets you that kind of that behind the scenes perspective and shows you how, uh, you know, the techniques they use to to kind of get your attention and and keep your attention. 
Okay. And, I, and, and I'll add one more thing and then we'll go to the next slide. I think <laughs> we, I, we, we could go up on that tangent for a while. It's okay. Hey, we got a co host, so you're going to get this today. Um, All right. We're going to get there. Okay. It's more, it's more than the code.org, you know, here's how we just do this initial scripting and get some stuff to happen on the screen, right? That this idea with media literacy of, you know, understanding purpose and audience and all, all of the aspects of a crafted message. And then we roll algorithms into that and the ways in which this largely opaque algorithm is, is having this influence. I mean, this, we've, we had a big push back to what, you know, over a decade ago with code.org and every kid needs to know how to code. But I really think that the media, media literacy is just going to continue to it, be, it, it to be more dramatically obvious. <laughs> we need to be doing this in more classes and having more conversations, not just with young students, but with people of every age, right? Because literacy, it's, it's it, anybody who's connected to the internet at all is being affected by this. And I would also just add to that is because you know how we're throwing so many literacies, oh, teach this literacy and that literacy. But if we consider algorithmic literacy as, as within the realm of media literacy or more general literacy, then we're not throwing here's this literacy and that literacy. I think that's the that's way of thinking about it. So looking at influencers here, um, as we know that you know, media used to be controlled by, you know, networks and there, you know, obviously it still is to, to a great extent, but now anybody can be a media star. Um, this person here, I just learned of him, them uh, according to the Google, he's the most popular influencer on YouTube, uh, Mr. Beast. Um, and I know he's in the news for something, but I don't, I don't know much about him, but, um, he, he but anybody can be an influencer. And I think kids I, and Wes can back me up on this, because uh, he's in the classroom, uh, you know, when you ask a lot of kids what they want to do, it's like, I want to be an influencer. So um, it's, it's, um, it's, I mean, obviously it is a big thing and people, some people are making a whole lot of money. But one thing to think about is that when we think about influencers, yes, you know, when we do, you know, any kind of presentation like we're doing now, I'm thinking about my audience and you know, how they're going to receive this. But Influencers also have to think about the algorithms. They have to optimize the uh, algorithms in addition to just appealing to the audience. So uh, that's a, another skill that influencers have. Um, in the book, uh, Renee DeResta kind of goes, kind of goes through some history and talks about gossips. And there's, you know, there's always been gossips, and gossip serves kind of a social function. And we, you know, people like sharing secrets and all that. But now we have kind of digitally powered gossips that is just amplified through the technology. And, you know, she kind of goes through the process of talking about how one random, we see this every day, pretty much some random voice, one person says something crazy, and then it gets amplified through social media, then, you know, the evening news picks it up. Um, and this is something that's new. This is something that's new. And some news, you know, uh, channels, you know, focus on <laughs> amplifying tweets and whatnot more than others. But it's certainly something that that happens a, a lot. Okay. Next slide. And the algorithm, as we all know, algorithms are not neutral, right? We know this. Um, we, you know, people think, oh, well, it's math and it's a procedure, so it's neutral, and it's not. Just like any other media, it's created by people with a perspective, and some things are included, some things are left out. Uh, it advantages some people may advantage others and the algorithm of course is not you know one thing it's multi it's multiple algorithms um and the power of algorithms to you know it shapes what we see and you know we've probably talked a lot about filter bubbles and those kinds of things uh in this group and um so the algorithms are going to give you what you want kind of related to this i don't know if any of you have done there are lots of slides for some reason uh, wes um on my screen I'm uh, scrambling <laughs> you're you're doing things on the screen that's fine um i don't know if I, i've seen this i tried it myself i saw it somewhere if you ask uh chat gpt about yourself tell me about myself and it's man it said a lot of nice things about me i'll tell you that it's very very you know it's like the algorithm gives you what you want so you're gonna stay there and that's how they're that's how they're uh programmed to, they're maximized for engagement. And so they're not maximized for truth. They're not maximized for honesty. They're not even maximized for accuracy. So they're really good at, you know, suggesting things that are going to get you hooked, but there's no, 
the fact checking in there. Uh, and, you know, I, I like the, the phrase that she's just troubling, troublingly amoral, not amoral, but amoral, meaning it's that's not part of the algorithm is let's make this moral. It's maximized for engagement. And I think this last slide coming up here is just a scenario that she she uh, describes in the book. And this is fictional, but it kind of represents a lot of reality. So she talks about this fictional character she calls Guitar Guy. And he has a YouTube channel where he's showing, you know, how to, you know, tips on playing the guitar, right? But then uh, one on one video, he talks about uh, Eric Clapton, the famous guitarist, Eric Clapton, uh, talking about COVID and his negative uh, feeling about people being required to wear masks and so on. And he found that the engagement went way up. And for YouTube, engagement can equal money, right? So then he thought, well, let me just, hmm, let me keep doing this. And then the more he started doing these kind of uh, controversial topics, um, he got away, you know, he would get more feedback, kind of a feedback loop, more money, more engagement. And then he just, you have to keep kind of turning up the, turning up the heat to keep getting more and more people to the point where uh, most of the followers are not really there for guitar lessons, but they're there for the, the, uh, the, the opinions. And, uh, and you can see this happening all the time, not just within one influencer, but between influencers, you've got to, if you want to get somebody's attention, you've got to say something outrageous. Okay. And even if someone is like, you're crazy, that's engagement. Right. So, um, I like, I like that example to kind of make things a little more concrete. I think that's it. Yep. There you go. So we definitely see, uh, so many things that Renee talks about in the book reflected right now in current events. And so this is just a current Google News search for the words disinformation. And so in addition to influencers, we read about uh, allegations of, non, of, of state actors, uh, as well as non-state actors, uh, attempting to you know, influence voters right now. Um, voting integrity. Uh, I've been listening to some podcasts about the ways in which, you know, polls are being watched. And we've got a very de de decentralized um, mechanism for, you know, voting and vote counting here in the United States. And so it, it, on, on one level, that's nice because it's not something that one, you know, a hacker could get into one system and then, you know, take down the whole thing. But it is going to be um, interesting, to say the least, to see what is going to be happening tomorrow and in the days to come when it comes to uh, either, you know, valid observations of some kind of irregularity uh, or will there be things that are fabricated, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, in addition, so that was just a search for disinformation. Um, here's a Google News search currently just for for Twitter election. And, you know, this New York Times uh, article from two days ago, how X, which I still call Twitter, but anyway, um, X, you know, and specifically Musk's account dominates the platform ahead of the election. The fact that he not only owns the platform, but his account has a lot of followers, but then he's able to, if he wants to, you know, change this algorithm in possibly opaque ways. We may be able to see those things, um, but but we may not. And so um, I think that is just fascinating. One of the things I do recommend to my students is to use Google News and to go ahead and you know, recognize that probably, most likely, uh, somebody who's you know operating in their garage is not going to show up here as a as a news source. Uh, but for instance, I'll I'll do I'll do misinformation because misinformation may be different than disinformation, and so depending upon the topic, I guess I'm not going to see it here. But if I go to uh, U.S. and I'm sure there's going to be U.S. election, one of the things that I really like is this full coverage option, and so you've just got a host of different news sites that are going to be on different sides of the spectrum. Um, in the past, this is interesting, they would also have direct links uh, to Twitter uh, or to X as well. Um, but anyway, we certainly see this reflected in current events and so many different ways that the the trends that that Renee is highlighting and the, the dynamics of changing information um, are, are, are very dramatic. One other thing that I would mention here before we talk about breakout rooms is 
Teresa tells the story of vaccines and how she became a, a vaccine advocate politically as a parent and how shocking it was to her that not only did she face opposition within California, but it was global. And that was really a catalyst for her writing this book. Again, if we go to Google News and we just search for vaccines, there are some really troubling headlines about potentials of, you know, banning vaccines and, you know, what kinds of, there's still debates that are happening right now over COVID-19 vaccines. And I think one of the reasons why this is an excellent book for us to study and to talk about and to share is because it is so important to think about the role of government when it comes to information, the broadcast of information, the sharing of information. One of the things that is bantered around a lot today is, you know, be a free speech uh, absolutist. And if you have read or even spent much time uh, you know, looking into QAnon or happening to be on 4chan or reading about 4chan, we have had examples of what happens when we have a largely completely unmoderated and unregulated uh, social media platform. And the dumpster fire and cesspool that that becomes is fairly shocking. And I think that as teachers, and Renee mentions the idea of a new civics and the kinds of things we need to talk about in civics education, and I see Barbara nodding her head and there may be some others, we really need to grapple with these issues within our civics classrooms. And this is so hard because it's so polarizing, but we can't just talk about the three branches of government and how wonderful and perfect it was you know, all throughout our history. We have a lot of different influences happening now, and Renee's stories about vaccinations is a is a is a case in point. And these issues are not just in the past; they're with us today, with the elections and with things that that we are continuing to see. So, uh, thanks so much to Scott for chiming in and co-hosting uh, this this uh, month with me. Scott has come up with some great topics for breakout rooms. And so you can read those on the screen. Um, I will also copy and paste those into our uh, chat. And what we want to encourage you to do, we've got about mm, 25 of us still here in the, in the Zoom, is uh, join a room and have a conversation. And we don't have designated facilitators who are going to be in each room. Scott and I are going to kind of jump around. And so please, um, you know, be uh, courageous and be the first one to... Uh, chime in and just, you know, introduce yourselves, where are you coming from, what's your professional role and your interest here in this topic, and then just take a stab at trying to address some of those questions, and hopefully we can have some good discussions. It is about uh, half past the hour, and so I think that we will be giving you 15 minutes to uh, be in these breakout rooms, and then we're going to bring everybody back, and then we will ask people who are in a different breakout room to just share a little bit about the conversation that you had. And if your your conversation ends up going afield from, you know, just exactly what your room topic is, that that is fine. But we hope that this will give you uh, a starting point. Scott, anything else you'd like to add before we invite everybody to choose their rooms? I think you addressed it very well. Okay, sounds good. Well, the chat room part or this part will not be recorded. We'll pause the recording. Um, but Scott, if you can go ahead and click open the room. Oh, yeah. I think everybody will see that. I'm going to pause the recording. Well, that was nice. You muted, Wes. You know, this isn't my first Zoom, but sometimes it, it feels like it, doesn't it? Thank you, Scott. I hope you all had good conversations. Um, oftentimes, the best part of the Media Club for me has been just being connected to some other educator who's interested in our topic and in media literacy. Um, and so we don't have to necessarily go in any order, but if, if anybody wants to volunteer to share just a little bit of what was talked about in your room, uh, if you want to raise your hand, I can go ahead and, and get you that way or, uh,
I could go first for room one if we if we need to, but anybody willing to jump in and, and please do use the chat as well and um, just chime in with what some some things that you all talked about in your I do a course on conspiracy theories with this guy. What's that? Go ahead. Be brave. Be brave. All right. Thank you, Kent. Go for it. Oh, you heading up? Oh, it's sure. quarter one now. Take it easy, Charles. Okay, I think somebody might need to mute. Yeah, if you're not on, just Kent, go ahead. You got the floor. Yeah, yeah. Just in the interest of kicking things off, um, I will. I was uh, in a room with Shelly and Randall, and um, I, just Randall was talking a little bit. I was just really intrigued by his work on um, building games, gamifying in education, and um, game that he's developing right now feeds kids, uh, puts them in teams, and then each team sees uh different media about um something it, it, the something in this case um for example um what could be um nuclear power was a topic so anyway they're they're absorbing right one team is 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 getting inputs um uh new stories that maybe is supporting nuclear power making it seem like it's in some light and and then there's another side and then and then the, independently, these kids are ingesting these and then coming out with recommendations or a vote or something based on the media inputs. And I just thought that was a really clever way of then require of building in the curiosity in kids to say, wait a minute, how did we come to this point where I'm hearing you suggest this? But we like everything we've read, like is supporting whatever, everything we've seen says this. So. I think that's because my I'm a longtime middle school teacher. Once you get kids, uh, as you are, I think you said you are too, Wes. Um, I think once you, once you get kids intrigued and and you make them want to know some more, then then you've got them. So um, for more, see Randall. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, if you've got any links, I connected with Randall at one of our other media clubs, and we've we've actually gotten together and talked some more because that gamified approach and being able to have kids into some kind of authentic challenge where they're getting different you know kinds of information they're having to do a breakout room or they're having to solve solve a challenge do a scavenger hunt that stuff is great um i was in room one with chrislin and she works with um, a group out of chicago called free spirit Clallam county washington yep. Clallam is the only county in america so i voted for the I person so who won the presidency every election cycle since 1980 this is what we call a bellwether county we came to Clallam a year ago to talk to you Look at that. See, I'm the host. Didn't did anybody else have this happen during COVID? When you're the host of the call, you can click mute on anybody. And that just makes you feel so powerful. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so we were talking about student created media, the need to engage with um, you know, with influencers and the ways in which students get their information now and the challenge that we have um with you know helping kids care and connect to the what what are issues that that they that matter that they can have a voice in and then how do those things get you know either brought into the curriculum or into after school you know we do have some broadcast media but it's more producing films for us for a film festival but i've been interested for years in student created media and it's so hard with the polarization now to bring in some of these kinds of issues but it's so important to help raise awareness about the ways like Duresta talks about that influencers are shaped by the algorithms and by by the um, you know the, the the rules in which the content gets amplified and the the roles that we can play as influencers. All right, somebody else grab the mic. You can uh, raise your hand or just just unmute your mic. Be bold. Well, Wes, I just want to kind of amplify what you were just saying about uh, media for all of us, because I think especially you know now, uh, it's so easy for us to get to feel disempowered, right? You see all, you know, these media companies, these influencers, TV, and, you know, they're shaping things and, and it's like, well, what can I do? It's just me. But just by allowing students to, you know, create their own media, even if it's not widely distributed yet, just to know that they have that power and that their voice can be uh, part of it. I think that's it. Because otherwise you could get very 
uh, cynical <laughs> about all this because it, it it's very frustrating just to see what's going on. And I'll chime in with this too, that it is so important to try to oppose nihilism. You know, we all have different values. We all come from different perspectives, different experiences. We're a wonderfully diverse country. And part of the big challenge that we have today is living in this very pluralistic society and figuring out how we can reach consensus and, you know, avoid out, outlier, or outlier extremist voices from dominating the conversation and silencing. All those are challenges. But I think the idea of trying to help students be able to share their voice, recognize the power that they have, and that hope is important, and, and that nihilism or just like hopelessness, like literally that's a goal of Russian disinformation folks, whether they're writing bots or, or whatever, like there are folks who would really like us to lose hope in our electoral system and, and in our whole structure of society and, and culture here in the West. And so I, I think that having hope for how positive change can happen and to a point that Krislin talked about, like these kids are the next generation, right? These are the, the students that are going to, they are leaders now, but they are going to be our leaders tomorrow. So it's, it's super important to... Um, equip them with skills, but I think also with hope that that probably can't be undervalued. And, well, and Wes, Wes, if we don't do this in an educational setting, we're just leaving it to the, the nowhere to do it. It's so critical that this is now included in education. Standardized tests, okay. I mean, they, they really occupy too much of a place, but we need to get people to think and students where else but in education. And they, of course, can then take it home to their parents, you know, and to other people and share the information. But 100%. this is what we need. Well, and student-created media can play a role. I heard a story years ago about Iran, and they had a small budget, and they wanted to do some kind of a campaign that was a public education campaign. I think it was related to health. But evidently, they adopted the idea of having a student media festival and having students create media because they felt confident that at least people within the circle of those students might watch those videos, you know, watch that media. Um, it's just... Talking about these issues that Daressa talks about, like, I don't feel like I can teach this to my middle schoolers straight up. <laughs> it's just so polarizing. So I don't know if you all have any any thoughts about that. We've got just a, I have my class actually starts here at the top of the hour in about six minutes. So we just got a few more. But let's have a couple of folks chime in. Be, be bold. Share with us. You, you don't have to share your thoughts. You can share somebody else's thoughts that were in your room. But I'm curious what other folks have talked about. Um, this is David. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about someone else. Um, I, I just, uh, one idea I really liked, uh, uh, from Chuck was he has his students create memes in order to, uh, th this was the room for pro uh, modern propaganda tactics. And, uh, and the, uh, the punchline was that usually by the end of it, you know, when they're finished creating these memes designed to fool and mislead people, they, they feel pretty terrible. That's, uh, memes can be dangerous, but it's so important to get into advertising, how are visuals and text used. And I've, I've wanted to do a meme unit for a long time. So is what, do you know what age he's working with? No, and it, I, I'm afraid it looks like you might have left the, the meetings. <laughs> I, I don't. I have, um, I've been involved with Chuck in uh, other media education lab stuff, and I think he's at the college level. Okay, good. Anybody else want to chime in with uh, something that was shared or? I want to chime in something really quickly, a little plug. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier that I kind of revisited uh, Renee Hobbs's uh, Mind Over Media book, and there is a companion website Um that uh, has lessons and ideas. It's a, it's focused on propaganda, but it really kind of aligns with what a lot of what we've been talking about. So I put that link in the chat for the companion website for her book, uh, Mind Over Media. Also made me think of, man, that that book is so good and the materials are so good. But it's like it's a couple years old and it's just interesting how it's kind of a 
a psychological treat that we just move on. Oh, that's old, but it's it still holds up really well. So put that little plug in there. Oh, you muted again, Wes. <laughs> You're such a great co-host, Scott. I need to remember my mute button. Thank you. We hope everyone has enjoyed this month's gathering. We will be here again on December 2nd. Uh, again, that's the first Monday of the month, same time, uh, noon Eastern, whatever that is in your area. This will be conspiracy theories in the 2024 U.S. election. We are probably going to do a January session about chatbots. There's been some unfortunate headlines recently about a high school student uh, who took their own life and the role that a chatbot played in that, and it really is a wild west. But in terms of topics, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, if you want to uh, reach out to me, you can do that. Um, reach out to Scott. Uh, let us know. Uh, you, I will, I'll change the uh, collaborative doc we've been using to commenting, but that'll still allow you to put some information in there. So if you've got a thought, something you'd like uh, for us to talk about, the Media Lab is a wonderful tribe. It is a great community. There are folks from all different levels that gather. It's an eclectic group. Um, but there's a lot of strength in that diversity, and there's just a lot of power in being a part of a community that really cares and is very passionate about media literacy and the ways in which we bring media literacy skills to whatever our, our students, whoever our students are, whatever our audience and our area is. So thanks to everybody for participating. We'll hope to see you again next time and hope you have a very safe election day tomorrow and uh, continue the important work that you continue to do. Take care.